Uh, Ram is a landscape architect specializing in creating urban nature experience in what he calls considerate designs. His award-winning projects, Kiryat Sefer Park and Enlightenment Boulevard, have gained significant acclaim in Israel. Ram's encounter with focusing in 2012 had a profound influence on his practice and academic career, expressed in his master's thesis, The Nature of the Goodness Experience in Nature, a phenomenal Phenomenological Inquiry Grounded in Eugene Jenlin's Ideas. He believes that focusing is significant in the, to the practice and study of design because design thinking involves a similar iterative crossing between experiencing and expressing. As an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the Technion University, Ram developed together with Donna Ganihar a course called Focusing in the Design Studio, which has recently been incorporated into the Technion architecture catalog. In 2018, he taught a design uh, a design studio at a um, uh, Mazor psychiatric hospital portrayed in the short documentary Architects of the Soul. So there's plenty more to say, but we're going to learn about you as you present. You learn things you didn't know. <laughs> uh, all right. So, so Ram I would ask um, if you can turn the lights a little bit lower so we can enjoy the pictures. And. Um, First of all, you know, there's some really special people in this audience, like Tova right here is responsible for me encountering focusing. She, she's the one who told me, you gotta learn this. This is for you. And then there's a few other people who were very, very helpful in the, uh, in the research that I will show you. In particular, Evelyn, where's Evelyn? Evelyn who's been my uh, personal TAE coach, and actually, which actually a lot of this stuff grew uh, from that, uh, that process that we did together. But I would like to, to begin with uh, a little story, uh, how I discovered the felt sense. So um, in 1992, I was a young architect, and I couldn't find my place. No matter what I did, it's just like nothing worked, nothing worked. And I had a lot of initiative, and I, did, I had a lot of effort, but a lot of things kept just collapsing. And, um, and it, end, it didn't end, but it uh, culminated in me actually having a terrible asthma attack and ending up in a hospital for, for, uh, for, for, for a whole week. And literally, I felt like I ran out of air. You know, it's like I invested so much energy in trying to get things to, to, to work, and nothing worked. And by the way, if you're having your neck kind of you know, sitting, facing, you just take a seat and break the, the circle, you know, it's like just sit comfortably. So um, at the time I was in the hospital, it occurred to me suddenly that something, that nothing's wrong with me, that something's wrong with, my, with the culture that I'm living in, that there's like a deep cultural problem of this achieving thing that I'm constantly trying to achieve and nothing's working and I need to just get myself out of the culture I mean that that's what that's what would heal me and uh, the next day I got out of the hospital I met someone who just came back from Ethiopia and he said Ram you must go to Ethiopia so I went to Ethiopia knowing nothing about what Ethiopia is I just bought a ticket the week after that I was I flew to Ethiopia and um, and funny enough just one of the projects I was working on, I got a phone call two days before I went to Ethiopia and he said, we actually want your project. And I said, sorry, I'm going to Ethiopia. I'll be back in a couple of months. I don't know when. If you still want it, I'll do it then. They didn't want it. But I went to Ethiopia and I was, um, I went not knowing where I'm going. I knew nothing about Ethiopia. And I flew, and luckily, I met an American guy in the airplane who told me, he asked me, why are you going to Ethiopia? And I told him, oh, I want to get out of the Western civilized uh, world. And he said, so why Ethiopia of all places? And I said, well, I thought about India, but India, I thought the poverty would be too much for me. And he said, oh, you don't know where, where you're heading to. India is light stuff compared to Ethiopia. So he said, just stick by me, and I'll show you the way. And, Indeed, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, encounter was 
absolutely horrific. There was, this was 92, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. People were dying, literally dying in the street, and in the streets of Addis Ababa, and uh, I was like totally shocked by what I saw there. And, um, and so after a few, uh, like a couple, like two weeks in Addis, I decided to move out, and I, and I wanted to go to where it's green and where it's beautiful. And I won't tell you the whole story because then I won't get to the lecture. But what happened was that I found myself hiking alone in Ethiopia for two months. And there was no one I could speak with because uh, people didn't speak English. And I didn't speak Amharic. I could count, but that's all. And, um, and I was alone. There were no other tourists. And I noticed at first that I'm constantly hearing, it's like I'm walking alone for days on, but there's all the time this constant chatter in my head. It's like I'm constantly listening to some kind of conversation going on. And after some time, I started to notice that this conversation was repeating itself. It's as if they were all just the same voices. I started to even recognize, them. oh, there she goes again. It's like, the, the, like in my head, I had these like a recording, played recordings of voices suggesting, telling me what to do. And and then, or, you know, in particularly, I started to notice there was a particular voice, which I called the weak voice. And what was so special about this weak voice was that when it came, it only came once. It never repeated itself, and it was always very gentle. It never insisted, you must go there, you must do this, don't do that, no. It was more kind of a curious little voice, like saying, ah, that's a nice tree. <laughs> and, and so I, I started walking, it's like because I had nothing better to do, I, I, I tried to follow that voice and just to see where it would lead me. And it was literally things like this, you know, just should I go right or should I go left? You know, it's like hiking and then saying, where should I go? And that little voice led me to absolutely incredible experiences, really incredible. I mean, this isn't the situation to tell about them. But when I returned, I had, I knew that I, I found something, something very significant. And I called it the weak voice because I was interested in physics at the time, and it was like the weak force that holds the atom together, you know. Um, so, 20-something years later, when Tova introduced me to, to focusing, it was like, oh my God, there, is, there are actually names to these things. There's a whole philosophy that explains it, and it was like, I've been doing this on my own, and I didn't know that there were other people doing this, but it was just as if everything fell into place. Everything fell into place. It suddenly made so much sense. So one thing is about being able to felt sense one's way in the world. And I literally mean in the world, not just in, in the interior world, but in the, and I'll talk about it more, about what architecture means to sense the world. And another, um, Another important thing which I discovered is that places touch us and they are able to make us feel good and this is what interests me, you know, how to make places that, that create well-being. So I want to do a little exercise with you, just a very short exercise because already we're running out of time. Feeling goodness in place. Let's, I'll, let's just call it a goodness in place, because we don't have a better term for it, but as you know, Jendlin would open a big parenthesis around it, and you can put whatever words you want in there. And I just want you to take a moment, and just like you just did, just notice how you feel right now. Just notice it. And since you're experienced focusers, we'll move on. And now, please connect with a place sometime in the past where you felt really good, where there was a real sense of well-being that was related to the place. Mm -hmm. 
and just let, let something come up, you know. If a few come, just choose one, it doesn't have, it's not so significant, just one. And when you have a place, just lift your arms so I see that. Oh, good. So we move on. So now just, I'll ask you, you don't have to answer, just answer inside, but, or I'll, we'll lift hands. Where was it? I mean, what kind of place was it? Was it uh, in a house? Was it inside or outside? Let's see, how many hands are for inside? How many hands for outside? Look around you. No, no, lift the, leave the hands up. In the outside um, category, how many of you were in a city? How many of you were in nature? Look around you. So nature definitely has um, a quality that a lot of people respond to for feeling good in place. Who were you with? How many of you were with somebody? How many of you were alone? About half. Was the person you were with, those who were with, was someone you knew? How many of you were with someone you didn't know? Okay, interesting. Now, take another check inside and see, how do you feel right now? Is there any difference? So, and if you are feeling slightly different from how you felt when I asked you first, what kind of goodness are you feeling now? What kind is it? What is this thing? Because there is a chance, I didn't ask that, but I'll say that some of you are feeling a little better after you've just visited your place of well-being. So, um, I'm going to talk about places that nurture us. And about the kind of goodness that it is and how that can be maybe implemented into design. I want to start with uh, actually uh, what Catherine mentioned, the, the project that we, we won some prizes for and some awards. And actually I'm not allowed to tell you which, but we just won a significant award for this, an international one. Um, so there's something that I know and I want to, and, and, and this knowing is the thing that actually got me into academia because I'm like a crab, I'm walking sideways into academia. I, I, I didn't go the, the ordinary way. Uh, I, first I did, I, I developed my profession and then from asking questions about what I know, I, I know but I can't explain, but I do know and the proof is that a lot of people agree with it, that this is really something special. So I know something about making places that are good. And, uh, and I think that there is a kind of universal well-being that, that we can access. Um, so I want to say a few things about design. First of all, these are the questions that, that, that I think about, you know. How can we make urban environments that are nurturing like natural environments? Can we do that at all? Um, and what does the felt sense have, uh, which role does it have in the design process? You know, because I, again, knowing from what I do, it has a role, but can, can I explain it? And how can the philosophy of the implicit be introduced into design and professional practice? So that's what this talk is going to be about today. And what you're seeing in the background are images from uh, this Kiryat Sefer Park where there is a little spring that actually there is a pool at the bottom of the, of the park and the pool loses water by evaporation. So once a day, instead of just adding water all the time, we, we add the water all at once, once a day, and they spring out of this little rock there. And so it's a real theatrical event, you know, children wait for the water to, to, to come out of the rock. 
And then there is a procedure, a, uh, like a train of kids, you know, walking along with the water. And then the water runs out. It's not a lot of water. It's just a small little dry river. And then they can play in the mud. And that's fun. And, um, and, in, and that's like in the evening. It's over and somebody is still there digging for water in the, in the soil, in the dry soil. Um, okay, so I'm not going to show this project because that would take too long. But I, would, I want to talk to you about, after this project um, got a lot of very positive reviews and, and actually people that I don't know would write me emails or call me up and say this is so significant, this is so uh, affecting me in such a good way. And, and it's not the only one, there are, there's another project in Tel Aviv that had a similar effect. And um, so I said, I, I, okay, so I got to see what it, if, can I say something about it? Rather than just do these projects, can I also, am I able to explain what's going on there? And that's when I went to do this uh, research. I went back to university and did a master's thesis. And I called it the nature of the goodness experience in nature because that's what I focused on. Not because I think it's that nature interests me so much. I'm interested in the experiencing of goodness in place. And uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit of that research. And first of all, the protocol. Um, so we used focusing for this uh, research. We actually took a group of students of focusing who were learning to become focusing teachers. So they were experienced enough. 16 participants. And I just took them to a forest. This is the forest. You can see the picture. And I gave them an exercise to find a place that feels good. They went in couples and then talk about their goodness feeling for 25 minutes and record it and that was it. <laughs> and that, that was the, the source for my, for, anal for the analysis. And, um, and then you know, comes the hermeneutic analysis and, and which took a lot of time, took two years to analyze and, uh, but some really interesting things came out. So the first thing that I want to point out is that there was a very significant um, differentiation between inside and outside. People would talk and you could very easily see in the text when somebody was talking about some interior phenomena or some exterior phenomena. It was very easy to discern. And another thing is that um, people describe the goodness feeling as something that's going on in their chest area. And this we knew already from the beginning, even before the research began, when I just interviewed some, uh, you know, I, I did some, some arbitrary interviews with people, and a lot of people described it as a sense of widening in the chest, a sense of uh, lightness. Um, and here, I mean, this uh, participant describing it like someone trying to cross through a hole in a fence and getting stuck in the middle. My body was the fence, and the felt sense was the person trying to get through. What a description. Um, the other phenomenon that's very uh, important is that of near speech. At a certain point in the, in the experience, the, 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 the descriptions started to become more and more metaphorical and almost had the syntax disintegrated into something that was sometimes even difficult to understand. Um, and it was obvious that people were beginning to speak more idiosyncratically and more like an inner kind of language, which is not yet formed enough so that I could understand what they're talking about, but they knew very well what they're talking about. Um, and running through this very quickly, I, I came up with two terms that describe this experience of the, of the experiencing of it. One is tasting. Tasting is the experience of taking something in, taking it into me, start something from outside, taking it in, and, and it can be either out of curiosity, where there, you can really relish the, the taste of it, or it can also be with fear, that you taste it very, very gently, as if you don't want to really have it touch you, just very gently, like with the tip of the tongue. So there's variations on the ways that one can taste experience. 
that I think the quality of tasting is that one tries to taste something without changing it. That you try to taste it as it is, so to speak, by taking it into you. The other experience I call dipping. And dipping is when I am in it, whatever that it is, when it completely surrounds me and it touches me on every extension of my perception. And that experience can be sometimes overwhelming, and sometimes it can be an experience which the geographer Robert Simon called, David Simon, called heightened contact, where it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a complete mystical and spiritual experience of being touched on every extremity. Um, so, another thing that we noticed, I noticed in this uh, research, was that there was a speaking from within the experience had a very, I mean, those of you familiar with U theory, uh, as a kind of a U shape. There was, first of all, people would speak about the experience or about what they are about to experience. And then, something happened that the, 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 the speech went down into a kind of a speaking close speech where things became more like the language became, well, the language, as I said, lost its coherency and became more uh, personal. And then something happened. They encountered something new. And through the encounters came another, a second about, which was something new. They Again, they kind of rose out of the water, could speak again in normal speech, described something, a new phenomenon, a new concept, a new understanding. For example, this, uh, this lady was looking at a bird's nest, and she was, uh, suddenly she, she was looking at a tree, and she said, oh, oh, there's a bird's nest in the tree. And then she kind of went into something, and at the end of this, she, she talked, it, it suddenly was about her relationship with her husband, and raising children and having a home and what it means to have a home, etc. So the metaphor of the bird nest kind of sparked that understanding. So I want to just introduce these two very important gentlemen who have done uh, work on uh, experiencing scales, experiential scales. So David Simon is a geographer. And he did very similar things. He interviewed people on their experiences of the world. And he differentiated between self and world. So, and he called it noticing. You know, the moment that you notice something comes at you from the world. Gentlin, in his experiencing scale, uh, describes something else. He talks about the experiencing scale within a therapeutic uh, context. And he talks about the difference between conceptualizing and being in a non-conceptual mode. So it's like something very, but in a way, these two things are, I saw them as combined. And I, I created here a kind of um, a map that shows the two fields or the four quadrants of this, what I call the field of meaning. So as we experience meaning, some of this meaning is non descript or non-verbal, uh, but of course it's meaningful to us, and some of it is about our interior and some of it is about our exterior. Same thing about uh, uh, what we have uh, more conceptualized, so we have like an, a concept of self, which is the interior, and a concept of world, which is outside of us. But all of it is about creating meaning, and what you see in the picture there are depictions, drawings of, I tried to follow the movement, or as people described, to see how their, their attention is actually moving between these quadrants in each focusing session. And what is so interesting is that actually it was quite easy to fill the quadrants. There were not so many things that, were, that seemed that they don't belong. And what you can also see is that the movement is kind of erratic, jumping from one quadrant to the other. So this is a kind of a graphic uh, symbolization of it, um, where I called it the flow of encounter, which is, can be a procedural representation, or what we just saw as the field of meaning, which is like a circular representation, but it doesn't go in one direction, it just jumps across from side to side. Um, okay, 
So that was about the research, and I want to talk about some, some design. So um, just to, to sum it up, the iterative nature of encounter is very important. Um, so first, there is an encounter with something new, something that doesn't have, an, doesn't have a form. We don't even know what it is. We just experience that we just encountered something. Of course, it all happens very fast. And the next thing is that we notice that we just encountered something. So there is a noticing that something just happened, you know. Um, and then we form a certain notion about what we noticed. And then forming of the notion requires languaging. It requires conceptualizing. It requires connecting it with something that we already have, something that we know. And uh, within the languaging, there is um, something I call contextualizing. It could context in this sense is different from situation. Contexting is, is, is a verb. We context by connecting things to other things that we know. And then comes the interesting bit, which is the return, because there is a return of what we just understood, and we, re we experience it as something new. And another circle of making meaning begins. And my hypothesis is that the sense of well-being is actually very, very strongly connected with this iterative process. That actually, and I think you can, you can remember the moment that you understood something. And there is a sense of relief, a sense of wellness, a sense of, a sense of goodness about the reforming or forming again meaning in the world. And I, I think the, the forming of meaning is at the core of this um, wellness, be, wellness feeling that we feel in environments. And that takes us into a very interesting discussion, which we don't have time to, maybe we'll have at the end. Now, just before I go into my own projects, I want to show you something I've learned recently from a most incredible book by a, a psychiatrist uh, called Ian McGillchrist. And he wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary. Has anybody here read it? Few. Those who haven't, I highly recommend it. The master and his emissary. And in the book, he talks about the difference between right hemisphere and left hemisphere perception of the world and how it actually influenced the history of Western civilization. And I want to start by showing here an example of um, experiments that were done. This is the one that the column on the left are people who just saw a flower and drew what they saw. And in the middle, there's a people who saw, who drew the same flower, again, the same people, but this time with the right hemisphere tampered with. So they were seeing mostly with their left hemisphere, or functioning mostly with the left hemisphere. And what you can see is that suddenly it's not the vision of the flower, it's as if they have a bird's eye view of the flower, it's a symbol of the flower. It's a symbolized notion of the flower, which is what the left uh, hemisphere does. Then when the left hemisphere was uh, tampered with and the, uh, the right hemisphere, um, they actually show much more detail in the way that they see the same flower. So um, the, the right and left hemispheres are different in the way that they're responsible for, for uh, seeing things. The, the, the left hemisphere, I just, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. Okay, I'll, first I'll explain something about bird brains and then we'll go back to that. So birds also have uh, split brains and the left hemisphere specializes in recognizing the familiar. That's its specialty. It, a bird needs to be able to peck um, uh, grain. It needs to identify the difference between grain and, and some uh, dust or or gravel or something, right? So it has to recognize the familiar. And it, to distinguish an object from the background, that's the specialty of the left hemisphere. And um, in doing that, it learns to completely disregard everything that's not familiar, that's not significant, everything that is not meaningful for its purpose. 
the right hemisphere has an opposite specialty. It specializes in giving attention to the background and to recognize the novel. So the, the right hemisphere is all about seeing that which is not yet known, recognizing something new which may become significant. Once it becomes significant, it hands it over to the left hemisphere to deal with and it continues to constantly be in the murky space of not knowing. That's its specialty. So if we look at humans, it's a little bit more complex than birds, but basically it does the same thing. The left hemisphere specializes in recognizing the familiar. And so, and by the way, the uh, grasping, the word grasping, which refers to understanding, but also to grasping with one's hand, is located also in the left hemisphere. So there is a close relationship between how the words we have and the and um, the way we use our body physically. So grasping is about controlling. It's about using something in a way that is meaningful to us. And language also, most of language is in the left hemisphere. Uh, the right hemisphere, however, is responsible for the creation of meaning. So people who have had seizures in left hemisphere, they lose the ability to talk, but they don't lose the ability to understand. So they understand what's going on. But people who have been damaged in the right hemisphere is much more difficult to treat because they lose the ability to understand the world. They can speak, but they make no sense of what they speak, and they, can, they cannot place themselves. So, um, okay. And of course, the right hemisphere is more passive, the left hemisphere is more active and controlling, and basically, we can say the right hemisphere correlates with a subjective experience or an, a within experience, and the left hemisphere correlates with an about experience and an objective experience. And of course, we need both. I mean, the, our health depends on our ability to switch between them and to have this kind of iterative turn between conceptualizing and um, and experiencing, which we, that's, that's all we talk about. But we live in a world which is a little bit out of touch with experiencing, and the reason is, and according to Ian McGillchrist, is this. Here we see, again, uh, the left and right hemisphere functioning in the left hemisphere. On the, right, on the side, we see a picture of a tree. What is so interesting about the tree in the middle is that it was done by the left hemisphere alone, and the left hemisphere, because of its uh, specialty in recognizing only the important, to it, only that, that which is important is only what is, concerns itself. It is over-optimistic in its knowledge of the world, thinking that anything that it doesn't know is, not, is of no importance. So in this case, it just doesn't consider the left part of the tree important because that's the responsibility of the right hemisphere. On the right hemisphere, on the other hand, draws a full tree, more complex, more full, and now I just want to show a little more about this. So here we see uh, tests that were made with people who had lesions in their um, right hemisphere, and they were given a template to draw, and this is what the patient drew. Like the left side is, is not significant, you know, but still there is, at least there is a full circle here. In this case, they drew a house, and look at the poor house, it doesn't have a left side. The most interesting thing is this cat where the researchers gave, drew a cat with two tails to see if they would notice that it has two tails. They didn't notice half a cat, not just they didn't notice a tail. So this is not nonsense. This is, this is really important things about how the different hemispheres, how different hemispheres work and perceive the world. And then when we go about to, to, to create landscapes for people, we have, we, I think it's helpful to understand this. So, now I move to my project, which I promised to talk about. So, um, so this is a project that was, um, that the municipality of Tel Aviv turned to us two years ago, and they asked us, would you do us a, a research on walking and walkability in the city? And I'll show you some examples of how we try to visualize what walkability is. 
But first, because you're not planners, I'll give you a little bit uh, of uh, an overall picture. So this is Tel Aviv. And this is the, the yellow part is the area which was de uh, deemed the pedestrian area in the, in the city plan which was approved five years ago. But once it was uh, called a pedestrian preferred area and it was approved, they didn't know what it means. So what does it mean to have a pedestrian preferred area? Does it mean there are no cars? Oh, of course not. You can't not have cars. And, and, and so they turned to some, uh, to five architects and asked, for a proposal of a methodology of how to fill this with meaning. And our methodology won the little competition because we talked about doing it in a, different, in a very different way than what they were used to. So, and, but the thing is, it all has to lead to an action plan. This isn't an, just an academic exercise. This is an action plan for a real municipality that wants to have tools that they can apply in order to make this happen. So here you see a graph of, uh, done by a firm called Arup about, the, this is a report that came out two years ago about the benefits of walkability. And what you can see is just how complex it is, just trying to draw the connections between all the different actions and areas of action and areas of benefit to the actual benefit frameworks is absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, they, it's an incredible work that they did, but in a sense, I find it almost, okay, so what do you do next? Okay, so you know that it's very complex. I want to just add to this the subject of cognitive well-being because that's, you know, that's what I've already explained that I think is happening. Um, so the thing about defining the issue is that, you know, people walk either because they have to or because they want to. And what we wanted is we wanted people to prefer to walk in the city. So what do we need to know? Mostly, most of the studies that were done so far, and here I go again to my favorite uh, quadrant uh, graph, um, were asking questions about physical space, you know? They looked at opportunities and threats in the physical environment, and most of the studies were done about removing threats. You know what will happen? Yes, you have to, make, to have a wide enough street, the paving should be good, blah, blah, blah. And I said, now we're going to focus on the experiential space. We're going to look at how do people experience walking in the city and what can we learn from that. So how do you study what experiences matter to people who walk in the city? This, this is a completely different question from something you can do statistically. Because you can't ask the question. If you want to know what really matters and what the, experience are, the experiences are, you have to obey to get into the experiences themselves. So we presented this to the municipality, and you can see there a, a typical street in Tel Aviv. You don't see so many streets like that in North America where it's completely contested. I mean, there, there's no parking, there's no place to put the bicycles, there's no place to put the trash. So people have to kind of navigate between all these things that take over the, the sidewalk. Um, and the sources of inspiration have also already introduced Ian McGillchrist, you know, uh, Gendlin, of course, and probably Emerson, but I want to introduce Claire petit Majin, who is a wonderful uh, philosopher from France who, who, who is busy with microphenomenology, and I think that she coined the term second-person science, right, Donata? No? But she writes about it very much. And I learned from her, uh, or let's say also from uh, Francisco Svarela, you know, we, we speak about experience. It can be learned in two ways, mostly. The, the common way is third-person science. We learn about someone else's experience as if we're not part of it. Then there is the other first-person science uh, approach, which is that we look at our own experience, which is what, what the phenomenologists did. They looked at their own experience, but the experience of the other is almost like a black box. It's so hard to get into somebody else's experience, except, of course, if, of course, if you're a focuser, then it's not so difficult. So that's where focusing came in. We can use focusing as a second-person science to methodology to do second-person science, to really really come close and empathically to somebody else's, somebody else's experience. 
So we developed the depth walk, which is basically a focusing session that you do whilst walking with someone. We had trained focusers who walked with people, and all they did is that they just listened to them, okay, for 20 minutes about describing their experience. So it was real-time focusing interviews done in motion. Um, and then we did some thematic reading and cruxing and mapping, which I will show you. So this is the project Gantt, which I'm very proud of because it's on paper and not electronic. But um, here are the basic premises. Um, first of all, that the most personal is universal. And that means that we can really access by, instead of having thousands of people report about their experiences, it's enough if we just have a few. If we really go deep into their experiences, we will get a very interesting perspective on the city that would actually be probably quite universal. And also that anything human is, in principle, understandable. So the process was, first of all, we went from personal to universal. We did the depth talk, we transcribed them, and then did some preliminary reading. Then we developed a process called Collective Insight, which was a quick shortcut to uh, qualitative uh, interpretation of this. So mapping, and then we developed the toolbox. Um, so the focusing were based in radical listening. I've already explained that. And basically, the interviews were just the interviewees were just asked one question before they went out. They met someone, they met an interviewer, and they were asked, are you going on a, a walk with a purpose? Or is it you're just walking for, without purpose? That's all. And then the interviewer was only supposed to guard them, so if they walk with their head up looking at the buildings or the trees, they won't bump into something, and uh, hold their bag for them, and you know, make sure that they don't step on uh, dog shit or something like that. And if they noticed that they were not focusing, then to coach them very, very gently to maybe notice another sense. Now, what we discovered is that, for, that is what I'm just uh, described. So what we discovered is that actually there was no need to do any guiding. Almost everybody we gave a microphone to would just, just went at it with uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Just having someone listen to you describing what you experienced was so much fun that even the people from the municipality went on. We didn't want to stop after 20 minutes, so we had them drag us for 40 minutes, and then we deleted half the, <laughs> half the interview because we, it was just too much work to analyze all of this. Um, but it was a lot of fun. People enjoyed it. And, um, and you can see here, this is by no means... Uh, statistic analysis, but you just just to get a note, a, a, a richness of the ages that participated, the education level, the gender, the uh, purpose, did they have a purpose or not, place of residence, half were not uh, uh, residents of Tel Aviv, which is very good, the time that we went on walks with them, etc. And then uh, we did the analysis of these walks. Once we had over 30 walks, and by the way, we did 60 walks altogether. That's, that's a nice number. Then we did the analysis of the walks. And this is where the, the, I think there was a really, um, uh, uh, how do you say, a uh, moment of uh, good thinking when we decided we are not going to be able to read this alone. So how about we do it, we do it with some kind of uh, something collaborative with other readers, just like we trust that few people's uh, experiencing is universal. Also, a few people's reading will give us a universal understanding of what we're looking at. So, um, so what we did is something that uh, we called collective insight, and it was fast, it was fun, and it was inclusive. And the way it worked was that we gave each uh, participant, we had like 15, 15 readers in a workshop, each participant was received um, four texts to read. Each text was read by at least two people, sometimes three. And all they had to do was to highlight sentences that, they, that, that meant something to them, that seemed important. And at the, at the end of this, when they had the sentences highlighted, we put all the sentences on the board, and then we played a game of sorting. And the game of sorting is as follows. 
you are, anybody can create a category and then move things under that category. And, but there's only one thing. If something is already in a category, you're not allowed to move it out unless the person that created the category allows you to take it out. But you are allowed to copy it. If you really want it in your category, you can copy something and put it in another category. That's no problem. And nothing gets thrown. Once it's on the board, everything is the, goes into categories. And there's one very important category, which is called the unsorted. So all the ones that don't have a category, they go into the unsorted category. And then we did, then we did something uh, which I, for me was amazing. We took the categories that once all the sentences were sorted, and we erased the name of the category, and we just did a list of sentences, and we sat with another group of readers who tried to give a name to this group of sentences. What is it talking about? And this is a kind of a TAE, uh, I think, process. And the most amazing uh, category came out of the unsorted category because nobody, the people who read it didn't know it was just a, a combination of sentences that nobody knew what they meant. So it seemed like a real category. And they said that it's talking about responsibility and care. And so um, these were, uh, you know, our core themes, which you will see soon. Uh, and you can see that some of them are quite universal, like life manifesting, appearances, freedom from threat, etc. This is, this is universal. This is in any city in the world you would find this. But there are some really very unique local themes, like at home in the city or a jungle of creativity. This is very, very much a Tel Aviv thing. Um, so, for example, this casualness of people feeling that they can go out, you know, with their socks <laughs> into the street or sit and, and eat. And, you know, it's like feel that the street is an extension of their home. And of course, there are other places in the world which is like that, but in Tel Aviv, there is something very casual. There was, we interviewed a Belgian um, tourist, and she said, you can't be too casual in Tel Aviv. It's like, <laughs> no matter what you wear, it's okay. Or this jungle of creativity, you know, which you really... Can ex you can meet people like that in Tel Aviv, and it's uh, it's it's typical of the kind of culture there. It's very unique in downtown Tel Aviv. Uh, other um, things were the architectural texture, a sense of uh, belonging and and alienation, which people reported had to do with architectural humility. They didn't like buildings that shouted themselves. Um, there was another thing, like look at the building, a sense of alienation with the building that's on the, on the, on the right, that's closed off, to, compared to the building on the left with the open balconies. Um, there was an interesting thing about the difference between vegetation and trees. People reported vegetation as something that more expresses care, but there's people behind it, and trees as something that expresses time, the presence of time and that the bigger the trees were, the more it felt like there was a history here, there was life here, like trees, trees were really very important. Um, and a sense of the sea, uh, even when you're not near the sea, you know, but you behave as if you're <laughs> near the sea. And then we go to traces of responsibility. For example, here it says, on the electric um, pole, it says, don't climb danger of death. You know, and that's a responsibility that was, you know, kind of difficult to see. Or this little Buddha, which was glued to the wall by somebody, just glued it to the wall and you couldn't take it out, but that's because they liked it. And then it also felt nice to have a little Buddha um, sculpture there. So we called it gestures of care and traces of responsibility. That kind of holds together the whole lot of the categories. Uh, okay, so this, this, this is the, the 22 categories that we had. You can see that they're broken up into subcategories. But I will just go through this a little bit faster now. So we tried then to do a mapping of the city according to these categories once we had them. 
And the way we did it is that we said, okay, we know that these are the significant categories, and we want to find how wellness and discomfort come to be in the city, in different parts of the city. So we say, you know, you can have feel bad, discomfort or wellness between one and three. And that, so we had a, a seven point um, level, what do you call it? Scale, a seven point scale in how we graded the city. And we looked at the city and together with the municipality, we chose one square, and which is 500 by 500 meters. And we looked at it and created a survey of those qualities in that particular part. The way it was done is that three surveyors from my office, they actually went, the three of them, and they walked in the, uh, in the street. I think there should be, ah, there we are. So you see all these red dots. Every red dot is a point where somebody felt that something changed, and then they stopped and they graded all the 22 categories in that spot. Except to, for places where you see a line, where the, the spots are so close to each other, that means that there was no difference along the street, so they just grade, graded it at each intersection and then connected the dots. But at the end of this, we had a sampling of each quality. And each quality, you can see that in some areas it's good, and in some areas it's bad, and it's, uh, it goes, it changes. And uh, here is the same two qualities we just saw before, mapped onto this quadrant. And now we had all this information, we didn't know what to do with it, so as landscape architects, the easiest thing is just to turn it into topography. And so we had suddenly these hills of of wellness and, and, and discomfort, you know, popping up in, in, the, in the city. But the interesting thing, thing happened when we overlaid them one on top of the other. And then we found out something very, very strange. It's like this is a section through a street. You see all 22 categories overlaid on top of each other. And you can see that at some areas, they're, they're very good and very bad at the same time, in different feelings. So here comes the next, so now from this we move on to the next uh, conceptualization which is dividing it between the public and the private. So we came up with three metaphors. The first one is the metaphor, uh, oh and first of all I want to say that all the, these three metaphors are very important because each one is like wearing a spectacle which enables you to see different phenomena. You have a right metaphor, you can see different phenomena. So, and this is the logo of the municipality, so this was very smart. When the municipality saw this, they loved it because we used their logo to, as a, to explain the, the concept. So we have three uh, metaphors. The city as theater, care and responsibility, and from city to cityness. So the first one is the metaphor of the theater. Um, we see the, the theater as consisting of actors and stage. If we separate them, we, act, we have two kinds of actors and two kinds of stage, which consist the city. We have the municipal and the, and the resident uh, actors, and we have public space and private space, two different stages that consist the city. And if we look at it again in my favorite pattern, um, then you can see that almost all the tools of, of um, governing that the municipality has are in one single quadrant, in the public space acted on by public servants. And then we looked at you know, what the municipality does in private space and what do private people do in private space that affect the city. And interesting, the, how much intervention of, of private people in the public space, which was the least of all. And it is very clear from analysis of the of the walks, that people who walk don't care if they're looking at, they don't even differentiate. They don't know if the tree they're seeing is growing in a private garden or in the, in the city. It doesn't care, it's a tree. Same with, with the buildings. Who cares if it's a municipal building or a private building? If it's nice, it's nice. If it's, if it's ugly, it's ugly. So the experiential element uh, of the city doesn't differentiate between public and private. So 
So we did, we, we, our proposal to the city was let's focus on these three quadrants. This is the area where you lack tools. You have enough tools in the, in the public area. And so, um, and so we actually developed tools for, for those quadrants. And I'll show them in a minute or just a few of them. The next one is care and responsibility. And the concept is that care is always an expression of an individual, always someone expressing who they are, what they value. And it could be uh, something like feeding the cats or, or uh, stray cats, you know, or, or having a potted plant in the window. Or um, what do we have here? Just a, a store lady that cleans the, the, the pavement in front of the store, right? These are all expressions of someone, and people respond very strongly to expressions of care, extremely so. So that even in places that were very congested and, and really run down, if it was a neighborhood where people expressed care, then it was lovely and people enjoyed being there and to spend time there. And in places that were new neighborhoods, come all new and all, you know, like all tip top, but nobody expressing care, it was very unpleasant streets to be on. The other thing is the responsibility, and responsibility is always a performance of duty by somebody that performs representing loyalty to their duty. And that can be something that is done even without care, like so many public servants, you know, do their duty and that's it. Of course, when it's combined, then it's very powerful. So um, here we see examples of the kind of duties and responsibilities. Our toolbox focuses on seeding care amongst public servants and sowing, is that so? No, not sowing, reaping, I think, reaping. I, I should have used the word reaping. Reaping responsibility from, from, uh, from individuals, you know? So like crossing between the two, so to foster a sense of partnership between the municipality and the citizens. And the last one is from city management to cityness. So until now, you know, most planners view the city like this. They view it from above. Remember the bird's eye view of the left, left hemisphere? This is a planner's view of the city, as if they live in some other planet and they just view it. And what we want to foster is a participatory stance, which is more an agential attitude, where you understand that you're never, ever an outsider. You're always a partaker of the, of the situation. And so it's all about emergent interaction. And now just a couple of tools to exemplify what we talked about. So there are 258 tools that came out of this project. And they're broken up into four categories. And there are many indexes so that any city servant can find, um, you know, if, if you're in the cleaning department, you can look for according to index of departments. And if you're, um, I don't know, I, I don't remember what the indexes are, but there's a couple of indexes. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of tools. So for example, local identity, which is a big issue, just to put images of the people whose the streets are named after is going to completely alter the way that people feel about it. Um, simple things, some other, so there's also like quick wins, you know? Or this, this one I like in particular, aliveness. This is a picture of a veterinary uh, shop, which uh, the vet leaves the window open at night and the light on in the, in the veterinary shop and he has a big screen on which he shows um, National Geographic movies throughout the night. And people just walk in the street, it's dark, and they stand by the veterinary shop and they just talk to each other and they enjoy looking at the, uh, at the, at the, at the movies. And it's, just imagine what it would be if the municipality would now support any shop owner that wants to light up their shop, subsidize them with lighting, lighting around the buildings. You see how dark the street is? And just the, the, the added richness of the private space that would be lit, how that would in influence the feeling in the street. This is an, a sad one. This is a story about a tree that was cut down. I won't get into it, but we do need to have a value assessment of trees even in uh, private, uh, privately owned properties. A touch of water. This is from my project here at Sefer. You know, just to be able to touch water in a very dry climate is, is something that is uh, uh, conducive to physical comfort. 
This is um, the idea of the responsive city. So on the top you see a project uh, from Lisbon where when you stand in a traffic light and you're waiting for the traffic light to change so the thing dances and then it's, da it's dancing on both sides so you can dance with somebody who's waiting on the others across the street. Or this one, which is uh, my idea, is um, we have a big wall in front of the municipality, a windowless wall, and I wanted to have this projected with this kind of liquid, which is uh, it's computer generated, and it responds to the people walking on the street. So as people would walk, they would create this flow that is projected on the wall, and the liquid itself has um, 14 different parameters that change its qualities. So it can change its viscosity, it can change its color, it can change its gravitational pull, and these parameters would be connected to outside sources, like for example, sounds in the city. So as you walk, suddenly a bus goes by, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the thing turns into smoke, or then it can turn into honey. It can be thick, it can be anything. Um, then we have the idea of governments, urban rangers, you know, instead of just having these people go around giving tickets to people who cross over the boundaries, we said let's educate them so that they actually can discern what is helpful to the liveliness of the city and what is not. So in this story here, we see, I think here, this is the previous picture, Oh, never mind. And we saw a policeman giving a, a ticket to this guy who put out his juice, his juice uh, thing, just like 30 centimeters out into the street, He's selling juice. That didn't disturb anyone passing there. So we proposed that there would be like a two meter out in front of the, in front of the, of the uh, residential, not the residential, the, uh, the shops, you could go out up to two meters so long as it doesn't disturb pedestrians. And then it, it would be a matter of thinking that they would have to apply, not just hard regulations. Okay, this is it. Uh, if you want to see more, you can take a picture of that thing and that will take you to my website. And, um, and I, I, have, I had a film, but I don't think I have time to show it. It's, uh, yeah, it's too late. So in the website, you, will, you can see a film about uh, my work with the students in uh, a psychiatric hospital, because we also are using focusing and, and the philosophy of the implicit in the academy, and it's and very, very interesting things are happening. So thank you very much.